a rib. So of course the meeting goes well, uh, they have a private talk and go for a walk and, um, they come back and the housekeeper brings over a plate of brownies and it's sort of a surreal experience for Jericho. And of course he doesn't resign with WCW and he says the WWF offer is three years at 450 grand a year with an intricate system based on bonuses, you know, which is going to be reflected by the attendance and pay-per-view buys. Meanwhile, when Eric finds out that he's talking to you guys, uh, Chris starts to see offers from WCW where they're even reaching the magical seven figure threshold, but he says he would have worked for the WWF. Even if it was for half the money, he knew that that's where he wanted to be. And when he actually did make the decision and go ahead and sign the contract, they announced it on the website. Uh, a month before the contract was up in WCW. And I don't think that that's something that happened very often back then, because especially when you consider the way you're going to debut him, is this more of a testament to the Monday night war and the competition between WWF and WCW that you just can't wait to, ha ha, we got another one, put it on the website. No, it was more of a experiment of sharing information and the instant gratification with information that was going on at the time with that thing called the internet. So a lot of it was new. WWF.com was new. And there was thought of, look, the other dirt sheets would probably have it out there. Why not beat them to the punch and have our website that have that be the main source of information for our audience instead of going out and finding it elsewhere. So it it runs that happy medium of it's going to get released anyway. Anyway, we might as well release it ourselves. Well, he's constantly making calls to Russo pitching ideas. What about this for my debut? What about this for my character? What about a feud like this? And eventually he finds himself at the post office, dropping off some mail and he sees a clock on the wall counting backwards and underneath the clock, it says countdown to the new millennium. So to keep you sort of caught up here, it's six months prior to the year 2000 and the clock is keeping track of the time. So, you know, we're tracking new year's Eve. So like 176 days, 17 hours, eight minutes, 12 seconds, 11 seconds. And he thought, man, that'd be a cool way for somebody to debut in the WWF. Well, why not me? So he calls Vince Russo and and pitches the idea of running vignettes with like a countdown clock for a debut, his debut in the company. And Russo calls him the next day and says, not only did Vince love the idea, but he's going to calibrate the clock to start a month before the debut. And it's going to hit zero at the exact moment of his first appearance, which was 20 years ago today, August 9th, 1999. When did you first hear about this idea? Cause it is. A pretty cool idea, especially at the time. I thought it was ingenious and it was a big way making a big splash. And this is how, how much you live inside the bubble sometimes. And, and here's the year 2000 is coming up and everyone is talking about what's going to happen to all the computers, to all the clocks, to all the mainframes all over the world when they've all been set for 1999 and and when they reach, when it all zeroes out at 2000, everything's going to stop working. Planes are going to fall out of the air. It's going to be this major catastrophic event. Y2K, you know, this is, this is just going to be a disaster. So there was a lot of fear in the country and the all over the world as to what's going to happen. And now we've got this countdown clock and it's not to the end of the year. It's, it's going to be in August and everybody's wondering what the, what the hell is this going to be? But again, as I was getting the point I was making is, is I had to actually just search to figure out what that term was, because to me, it's always been Y2J because it was ingrained in my head so much My gosh, that I forgot what Y2J was. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. You probably hear me every week, maybe a few times a week talking about wrestling, but I really am Conrad the Mortgage Guy, and we're happy to help you save some money today. Whether you're tired of throwing your money away on rent 
We can get you in a brand new house with little to no money down. Maybe you'd like to get rid of some credit card debt or pay off a second mortgage. Just lower your monthly payment. Now, as always, you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket. And if we can't help you save some cash, we won't waste your time. It just takes a few minutes to get started. Just fill out the fast and easy quick quote right here. What the other one was. That Y2K, I, I think that, you know, again, wrestling fans would probably, they probably still, if you were to ask them, what was that thing called at the end of uh, 1999 that they were all afraid of? Oh, Y2J? Yep, as old Y2J. He was going to get in there and fuck up all them computers. I know he was. Can't trust them people with that long hair. So Chris, uh, goes to the WWF offices about a month prior to the debut and he's there in Stanford, Connecticut, and he meets with Jim Johnston, who I think most people listening to this know wrote a lot of the superstar theme songs. And he's having a conversation with Jim about who he was and what his character's attitude was. And he's trying to get sort of a vibe of the way the music should sound. And then he meets with Kevin Dunn and they're talking about maybe what the entrance video looks like. And he plans to use a double blast of pyro to give the arrival extra impact. And he's going to take some promo shots and go meet with the merchandise folks. And he says, it feels like he's stepped into Oz because now, you know, this is a much bigger machine and it's working much differently than the way WCW had. And, uh, when he finally sits down with Vince McMahon and Vince's office, he throws him a script out of his desk for the movie toxic Avenger number four where he says there is a part written specifically for him. And he says something like you've been here for a day and you're already a movie star. And, uh, then he hits him with the big bombshell. The idea is to have this countdown to the new millennium clock reach zero right in the middle of a promo by the rock. And that means obviously there are big plans for Jericho chat me up about why him debuting in the middle of a rock promo was the right call. If you're going to make a splash and you're going to make a first impression, you might as well make the biggest one that you possibly could. And rock was the biggest star in the company at the time. In addition to that, the rocks promos were probably the most entertaining at the time. So if you're going to interrupt anybody and you're going to come out and state your case, you might as well do it with the biggest audience and the biggest star, biggest platform that you possibly can. Well, that was going to happen for sure. We should mention that, um, the debut is going to happen here at the Allstate arena in Chicago. One of the more famed WWE arenas, especially in this era. And he's got a pair of Harley Davidson leather pants on and a silver rave shirt. And, uh, he's got a top knot and the Billy goat beard that he's grown out special for this occasion. And he bumps into Vince getting coffee. And as Vince sort of looks him up and down, he says, it's cheap heat Vince. And Vince says, indeed, with a weird look on his face and struts away. And he goes over his promo with Russo and he doesn't have any major concerns. The rock joins them and they're rehearsing the whole thing once in catering. And that's it. They both have done this before. So you don't need much more preparation than that. Do you remember meeting with Jericho or working with him at all that day on the, on the debut? Not anything more than saying hello, wishing him luck and telling him when to go out. Um, the, the creative that was all done with Russo and him and rock. And it was one of those moments that the audience was waiting for because they all knew there was anticipation. Is it going to be Jericho is it going to be somebody else. It was still during that time that big moves meant something. And this was a big move. This was a major acquisition that had been with the competition before and we wanted it to be a big splash. But I think that when they had the, the video wall up and the whole animation getting there with the ball rolling down and, uh, that big reveal of Y two J and they knew exactly who that was and, and we're happy. You know, you saw the Jericho and all that shit and it just, it was good stuff. It was good stuff. And, uh, what a big way to debut right there with the rock in the middle of the ring. And of course, Jericho's going to come out to a huge ovation and start doing his promo. And remember he's interrupting the rock 
and, uh, the rock asks him what his name is. And then of course he says, I told you it's and the rock pops off. It doesn't matter what your name is. A lot of people would look at that and say, boy, the rock's really owning him here. This is not the right way you debut a guy. And it's been debated a lot that maybe, uh, obviously I know you're taking, this is going to be different, but a lot of people would say, man, if you're just going to have him come out and the rock clown him and say, it doesn't matter what his name is. That's not how you get a guy over, but I have a feeling you're going to have a different take on that. Oh yeah. It's totally killed Austin and Mick Foley <laughs> and everybody else that he ever worked with. Yeah. It's just terrible. That's just the worst. Well, I mean, I would, he, he should have just come out and pin the rock the first night and, and then beat everybody in the company the, 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 on the very same night. We should have had a gauntlet of every single guy on the roster and beat them one, two, three in the middle of the ring that night and take every belt and put it on him and never have him lose another match. Is this right now? I'm not sure. Am I, am I talking to Bob Holly right now? I'm, I'm just saying what apparently everybody thinks that we should have done since we shouldn't put him in the ring with the biggest goddamn star in the company at the time and have him banter back and forth and have more eyeballs on him than he ever did working with Hoovy, some guy named Hoovy Tude, uh, years before. I love that you remember the Hoovy Tude shout out. Oh yeah. Uh, What's the feeling, you know, after the segment, it's a, it's a 6.53 rating in this segment. And, uh, he comes back through the curtain, you know, what's the, what's Vince's reaction. A lot of people come back through the curtain and they're looking for a nod from the chairman. Do you think Vince was pleased? Yeah, I think he was, uh, for me, uh, I was extremely pleased. I thought that he was able to hold his own and was right there. There were a few missteps where he was tickled by some of the shit that rock was saying, and you can catch him laughing and some of that stuff. But at the same time, some guys get flustered in that position and Chris didn't miss a beat. He was able to hold his own and, and hang in there with the rock. And that's what it was. That's what it was meant for. He was either going to sink or swim right off the top and he swam. 